What's happening, Hardscapers? This is episode 157 of the How to Hardscape podcast, where we talk about how you can start and grow your hardscaping business. And today we're joined by Matt Daly of Water and Earth Landscape Design. I really wanted to start to get designers specifically on the podcast, and we kick this off with Matt here talking about how he started his business, all the way to talking about design, his thoughts on design, and just picking his brain here. So go check out Water and Earth Landscape Design, W E underscore Landscape Design on Instagram to check out Matt Daly's work here. And if you're adding outdoor lighting into your installations, go check out Inlight Design. That's I N L I T. E design on Instagram. Get some inspiration from their page and take a look at their lighting products that they offer the hardscape industry and landscape industry and go tell them that you found out about them from the How to Hardscape podcast and start a conversation with them as well as Cycle CPA. If you need a team of bookkeepers, accountants, or CFO services for your business, especially at this time of year when we are starting to get really busy and bookkeeping gets placed on that back burner, go check out Cycle CPA, start a conversation with them. And if you let them know that you learned about them from the How to Hardscape podcast, you get $200 off their services. And without further ado, let's get into today's episode. Today, we're joined by Matt Daly. He is an outdoor living designer with Water and Earth Landscape Design. He serves the Bay Area of California as well as Richmond, Virginia. Matt, thank you so much for joining us here. Yeah. Hey, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Matt, let's get started to get a little bit of background about you, yourself. Um, how did you get started in this world of outdoor living design? Where did, where's the starting point for this? And where's the catalyst to eventually start your own business? Yeah, so I think I started where a lot of folks did in the in the industry, you know, with a, you know, a lawnmower in the, in the trunk of my Ford Taurus driving around trying to figure out how to make money when I was, you know, bar money when I was younger. Um I let's see. So I uh, did odd jobs, pushed lawnmower for a while, and then I started my first company. So a landscaping installation company. I was horrible at it, but I had a few employees, and we did that for a couple of years. Um, and I was in school at the same time, learning about landscape design, horticulture, and construction. And um, that kind of brought me into the world of of, of high, a higher end um, outdoor living spaces. So. Um, I sort of fell in love with the classroom more than I did what I was doing in the field. I was really was not good at, at running a landscape business, um, especially looking back on it now. But uh, so I decided to, to close up shop and go work as a salesman for a high end custom outdoor living construction company. And um, yeah, I worked for them for a few years. I was, it was really interesting as a bunch of um, they were all when when that happened they were all 50 something so these guys had been in the industry for for 30 years with no no google or youtube or instagram right so they they were just going off of the phone book and word of mouth kind of stuff so really learning about that kind of guerrilla marketing stuff that they had to do to stay at stay at the top of people's interest levels and um after i did that for a while and fell out of love with it just because i, I didn't really know how to be an employee right i was it's a lot different than pushing a lawnmower um I, I kind of left there and, and well, I, I wanted to be a designer, but where I was living in, in Richmond, Virginia, it's a hard place to be a, a, a designer if you don't have the street cred. So I went and started as a salesman, basically selling everything that has to do with backyards for different companies, you know, a concrete stamp, concrete company, outdoor lighting, planting, hardscaping, and kind of just learned how to survive off of 5% commission. Um, friend did that for a long time. That's really interesting. Was that like a conscious decision where you knew you wanted to start this landscape design business, but you figured it'd be good to kind of get that experience of these different facets of, of kind of outdoor living? Yeah. I mean, I, I wanted to be a designer, but all these older guys that I was working for at the time were basically telling me that it was impossible to be a designer. And that I had to be a salesman. And then once you sell the client, then you can design. But they, you know, looking back on it, they didn't want me, they just wanted me to be a money machine. They didn't care about design. They wanted me to be pulling those projects in so they could make their margins and just kind of keep me um, in the dark about what I could potentially be. So um, I, you know, starting a landscape design business, you know, or a firm, I guess you can call it, I never 
that was never on the horizon. I just wanted to be a designer, but I didn't know how to do it. And I didn't have a support system to sort of, or a mentor for that matter, to kind of pull me through their thought process. So I was kind of stuck in this whirlpool of, of sales and didn't really know how to get out of it. So then what, how did you get out of it? What was that like kick in the butt? You know what? I'm doing it. I'm going forward with it. Yeah. So I think there was sort of, I had sort of a mind shift somewhere through the sales, that, that, that sales career that I had for a while where I wasn't just selling for one company. I was selling for multiple companies at a time. There was one project in particular where I was the salesman for, I think, four or five different companies. And the homeowner kind of was like, what the hell? And everyone was kind of like, what the hell? And I kind of realized like I had engin- not really engineered, but engineered this entire project um, for all these different companies. And it's like, well, wait a second. I'm basically planning this project as a salesman. I want to plan this project as a designer. I don't care about 5%. I just want to figure out the circles and the squares and, and how they all fit together. So after that, someone had told me about a company that was hiring, a design build company. Um, and they ended up giving me a job offer, which was um, it was basically no money. But it was it was money, and they were going to let me be a designer. And so I went in with them, and they were my first of about – four design build salary positions that I had before I went out on my own. When it comes to design and starting your own design firm, uh, you mentioned Richmond, Virginia was not quite the, the place to be. Did you relocate to the Bay Area and start your business there? So we did relocate to the Bay Area. It wasn't because of my, it wasn't because of my business opportunities. It was because of my partners. She had a, an opportunity to um, she is in PR and she, one of her clients, which is a fortune 50 company, one of their top people were going on maternity leave and they asked my girlfriend to come handle that. And, um, it was supposed to be a six month thing. So, you know, you know, let me just say this in Richmond, there's plenty of outdoor living designers that do very well for themselves. But at the time I just didn't have the portfolio. So I was just kind of like the new guy. No one really cared who I was. Um, so we relocated to the Bay Area for what was supposed to be six months, but I started Water and Earth as kind of a side hustle just to make you know a few thousand while I was there. I had no understanding of, of anything about the Bay Area. I thought it was going to be like moving to another Los Angeles, just a different part of California. And, um, and once, I, once I was there for a while, I kind of understood the power of the place. But I, the side gig of Water and Earth quickly became the main gig and ultimately the reason that we decided to stay for four years and not head back to um, head back to Richmond. Would you say that landscape designers in Richmond have a different taste, different style than landscape designers in the Bay Area? Are there two different opposing kind of styles when it comes to that design? I think, I mean, there's a lot of ways to answer that question. You know, it, the Average construction of homes is a lot different between the two places. You know, in Richmond, Virginia, it's very traditional, colonial. You know, this is where America started. And then California is is newer. Uh, but, you know, there's you know many more stucco homes and modern homes in the Bay Area, whereas in Richmond, it's kind of not very many different styles of homes. Um, I think that, you know, the the spend, the project spend in, in Richmond is, is significantly less than it is in the Bay Area. But the cost of real estate is, is um, there's no comparison between the two places. I mean, here in Richmond, you can get, uh, you know, you can, for a million bucks, you can get a, a, a state, you know, in, in the Bay Area for a million bucks. I mean, that is a glorified garage, like not updated. So it's, it's you know, this, the spend there is a lot different. Um, I think a lot of designers in the Bay Area, or rather, let me back that up. A lot of designers in the Richmond area aren't used to working with huge budgets, you know, three, four, five, six hundred thousand dollars, hundred thousand dollars. But I think that designers in California don't get the luxuries of working in a place like Richmond, where it's a lot slower and people value your time more. And it's, you know, if you get a call from somebody in Richmond, it's likely that they've really done their homework on you and they want you to be a part of their project as opposed to California, where people are just trying to call people to find out who's available. There's a, a lot that uh, you just said there that I want to touch on. Um, yeah. Starting with when you're starting your own business here in, in the Bay Area, where does your, your design background knowledge come into play? 
where you know to kind of tailor your designs to the home and 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 start to get kind of get that snowball going where you you came from Virginia, you're in the Bay Area, and you know if you're starting a design firm for the Bay Area and catering to that audience to those homes, that you're able to design to that home. Did that just come naturally to you, or is this something that over the years you had to build on and understand? And really, uh, that comes into play here when you're starting your own business. Yeah. So, like to touch on Richmond, like you know, in Richmond, the, the game, the kind of sales pitch you hear from all the designers and the design build guys is we're going to make the we're going to make the backyard look like it's original with the home, which you can do because all the homes are 100 years old. But in the Bay Area, it's it's not 100 years old. You know, there's still old old homes, but they're just sort of the majority of them are boring tract homes, right? Um, and so there isn't really a style that matches that, right? It's not something like to the end of the spectrum of a place like Arizona or New Mexico, where you're doing like a, a really interesting kind of Adobe design to, to, to match, match the Adobe home. Um, it's the, the architecture is really boring in San Jose. So, you know, one of my downfalls when I first started is I didn't have any portfolio to share in California other than the stuff I had created in Virginia. But I didn't want to be doing traditional design and all the things that I had in my portfolio were traditional design. So I kind of got into this um, snowball the wrong direction, though, because I was showing traditional work and then all these traditional minded people <laughs> were reaching out. So it wasn't until, oh, um, I don't want to say her name, but um, I'll say her name. She wouldn't care. Her name, her name was Vina, and she was the project that changed everything in the Bay Area. Um we kind of just, we designed it together. She, I, I gave her the first thing. She wasn't into it. She was kind of telling me what she wanted, but I wasn't into it. And we really just spent, you know, five or six hours sitting together drawing. And it was that first modern borderline contemporary project. Um, and it, it, I guess you could say it went viral quote unquote on, um, on, you know, the, the airwaves, but uh, that's what started everything. Um, from there, the modern projects were just flowing. And now we are one of a small group that's known for pretty much only doing modern outdoor living design in um, in the Bay Area with a, a you know with a wider Bay Area an audience of about seven million people probably. With that uh, budget came up, and I want to know when a client first reaches out to you. I'm assuming more and more they're hearing about you. They've seen your work. They're reaching out to you for a reason. How are you getting budget out of them so that you I, I'm sure that's a, a very important thing for you to get out of them so that you know what to design. But how do you go about doing that? I mean, I'm painfully honest with people when they call me that I'm not I'm not there to sell them a two, three hundred thousand dollar thing. I know. And there's no financial gain for me for you to spend more or less money. Right. My cost is what it costs. And if you're in the richest part of town or you're in the poorest part of town, which is the poorest part of town of the Bay Area is still pretty rich. Um, it's, it, you know, I, my, my costs are the same. So it, I, usually by kind of saying that they understand, they can kind of let their guards down a little bit. Um, there's the people that the minority is the people that don't know how much things cost. And then there's the majority people may still not really know what they know it's going to be expensive. Um, but it's, it's, it's a pretty fluid conversation. I just sort of build the trust and you know, from, from Instagram and Yelp and all the things, there's already sort of that authority that's, that's gained. And they understand that I, you know, or that we do, we know what we're doing and we're good at it. So, the, you know, with that, and then that conversation, they're usually pretty easy to, um, to, you know, to get that information out of. And I, a lot of people spend a lot more than they think they're going to spend in the beginning. And um, we explain that too. So how do you sort of, how do you get a low number educate them on what, on why, what they want costs more, and then figure out how to sort of value engineer that. So they get what they want, but they also pay what they want. What are you doing to pre-qualify clients to see, like to turn the ones away that you don't think would be a good fit and to take on and focus on the, your time with the ones that you think would be a good fit. So I've talked about this before, but in, and I try to tell as many people I can, you know, industry guys about it because it just saves me so much time. But the, the form, the type form that I have on my website, basically a, a 20 question survey they have to fill out. I will not talk to you on the phone unless you fill that out. And within that survey, they can then schedule a 15 minute phone call on my call calendar, which I can edit the times I'm available calendly. I mean, everyone knows that everyone uses it. 
Um, so that's, I mean, that's the best way to vet people. And then on my, on my San Jose page, uh, not the Richmond page, but the San Jose page, I have a, a, a button you click right before you get into the, the survey that says, are we a good fit? And there's two columns. We're a good fit if, and we're not a good fit if. And I haven't looked at it in a while, but I think it's, we're a good fit, it, good fit if you're spending at least a hundred K. Um, and you know, I get so many phone calls from people who want to spend 30 or 40 or 50 and Richmond all day, you know, you can do something in your back backyard for 30 or 40 K, but the Bay area, you're not getting, I mean, a driveway in some cases for that. So it's, you know, there's, um, it's, it's hard to vet people, but I think, you know, when, once you've been in the industry long enough and you have the portfolio to support sort of your narrative of, of what you're doing and, and what you want to do. I, after a while, the, the, the tire kickers kind of just go away, right? Because um, it doesn't matter how much money you do or don't have. If, if, you're, if you're a low spender, I hate to say that, it sounds scammy, but if you're a low spender, you're not going to look at this beautiful backyard and think that you can get that for 30 grand. You know, p- people know it's expensive. So it kinda, it's, as we continue to grow our portfolio and our client base, you know, I get less of those calls, but um. I think it's important to still help those people, right? You know, you have the client experience um, sort of be full circle in the sense that even if somebody isn't a good fit, you know, I'm often referring other companies. I know there's guys that I know that charge less for design, guys that I know that charge less for construction out of the contractors that I know. So, um, you know, even if they're not a, not going to be a good fit for us, we're always going to get them to who will hopefully be a good fit. So I want to skip over the design process for now, revisit that. But yeah. when it comes to the client has approved the design, where do you take it from there? Do you have a contractor network that you manage the project from there? Or is that somewhere that you're taking the business? Or can you talk about that? Yeah. So design's done. It's been a few months. We've talked about the design with the client until they're blue in the face. We've gone through multiple iterations. They're pumped. or just <laughs> exhausted. Uh, then we're going to go to contractors. So probably have a pool of about six contractors in the Bay area, and then about five pool builders. And we're going to sort of identify the top three people that are going to be the best fit for the scope of the project, depending on budget, skill set when it comes to installation, and then also attitude. And attitude is a really big one that people don't really think about. Like John Smith and Joe Smith, like Joe Smith being the contractor, like they might not they, they might not be a good fit because they're not going to get along. So after working with somebody on, de- on a design for two or three months, you get to know them pretty well. And I know who's going to work together well and, and who isn't. And sometimes I get it right. Well, most times I get it right. Sometimes I get it wrong and it's a train wreck. But um, yeah, we bring, we bring the contractors in. We have them provide bids. Um, then we review the bids with our clients and then we stay engaged. So one of the things I have been trying to figure out for the longest time is potential clients always say, so you manage the project. And I always say, no, we don't manage the project because you know we manage the expectations because any of the contractors that we bring in that are high, you know, high end and, and high performing companies, you, you homeowners pay the higher costs for a company that can manage itself. So I don't want to come in behind those guys and say, yeah, we're project managers. So like, we're not managing the logistics of day day to day. You know, we're not calling anybody and saying, "Hey, you know, so and so landscaping isn't coming tomorrow because they got a flat tire over the weekend." Right? We're just staying engaged to monitor the construction, make sure it's being done correctly, make sure the design is being executed as it was designed, and if there's material issues or, I mean, any issues, we're getting involved and having, um, you know helping the client or the contractor figure out what we need to do to get the project to move forward. When it comes to, so are you paid upon project completion or our design approval? So we get paid, we are paid once the design is completed, but we're contractually obligated to our clients to help with construction. Um, I used to do a, a payment plan where you know, it was like a 20% deposit and then, tw- then four more 20% throughout the project. And, you know, two of them were in construction, but we had a lot of clients that would table the design after the design was completed. And I was still owed 40% of the money. So we started having people pay us hundred percent of the money through the design process and then staying engaged through construction. And some, some people kind of have a pain point with that. You know, well, if you're going to be here through the construction, when, why, 
why am I paying you before the construction starts? And I get it, but you know, they could just say, oh, actually, we're going to go to Italy for three months. And you know, I don't hear from them for a year. So that's why we do it that way. Yeah. That was, that was going to be my next question was that payment schedule. And also with that, the revisions that you may go through with clients, is that based, um, on like, do, do they have a certain amount of revisions with a contract that they sign or for each revision, do they get charged up like a, a next level? How, how would you structure that when it comes to a design? So I have a, so when I call it tried and true, because tried it, we've been doing it for years and it's, you know, we've, we have recooked and rebaked this, this design process to where somewhere where we like it and our contract are, are, well, our land, our homeowners and our contractors like it, but we've got three phases of design. We have a concept phase, a 3D phase, and a final phase. Within each phase, there's two meetings, two iterations of the, the design the client's going to see and be able to offer feedback on. So really, they are seeing it and giving us feedback six times throughout the process. Um, and two of those times, they're seeing it in a hand-drawn form, then two times, they're seeing it in 3D. And then we're doing a material discovery process where we review the design and the materials and then final designs. Um, we don't charge hourly. Hourly is a very popular way for designers to charge. Um, I don't like it because I think that with hourly, there's somebody's going to get screwed. It's either going to be me or it's going to be the client. Um, I think that uh, there's a lot of designers that I've heard of that will just like, will answer a 10 minute email and, or spend 10 minutes answering an email and like charge for an hour, you know? And then you got to think if you're doing spending two to four months in a design process and then a month on bidding, a month on permitting. And then, you know, if it's a smaller backyard, um, you know, three months, and if it's a pool and the whole spread a year, those hourly costs are going to add up. And I always tell clients like, and they're like, Oh, you're expensive. I say, well, I can charge you hourly and <laughs> be a lot more expensive. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, I like to, I like to have a set fee and we have a, we have a, a set range that we're pretty much going to be in, but you know, really what that comes down to is, I mean, it's typically five to 8% of the project budget. Um, considering that most of our projects are 200K and above. I just want to take a break from today's episode to talk about our sponsor, Cycle CPA. You may have a CRM or project management software in place, but what data are you using to ensure your estimating is accurate? Having a proper accounting setup and accurate bookkeeping done is key to understanding overhead expenses and other costs that must be recouped in your estimates. Cycle CPA is a remote bookkeeping and CFO firm that helps to connect the dots from the financial reports to the hardscape and landscape data needed in order to reach high profits. They provide landscape and hardscape industry benchmarking, job costing financials by service line, advisory meetings, and much more. Cycle CPA's team of accountants are specialized within the hardscape and landscape industry, and you can visit them at CycleCPA.com and for $200 off, mention the How to Hardscape podcast. Now back to our episode. We also want to say thank you to Inlight for sponsoring today's episode. Did you know that one of the easiest ways to grow your hardscape business and increase your revenue is by incorporating low voltage outdoor lighting to your projects? Using lighting can take your projects to the next level, make you more profit and add that wow factor and make your business stand out. As a professional hardscaper, we know you need reliable and high quality products to avoid callbacks and wasted time on job sites. That's why Inlight offers some of the the highest quality lights and is the quickest system to install on the market. Their patented easy lock connector ensures that lighting will be the easiest thing you install every time. No heavy lifting, no massive machinery, just plug and play. Not only that, but InLight also provides many educational resources like online and in-person training, installation videos, unbeatable customer support, and more. Everything you need to successfully take your business to the next level with outdoor lighting and beyond. It's one of the many reasons why I stand behind InLight and many other companies that provide these educational resources to their clients, to contractors, and to help us grow our businesses. So for more information on how InLight can help grow your business, check them out on Instagram at InLightDesign. That's at I-N-L-I-T-E 
Design on Instagram. DM them to find out how to put more money in your pocket this season. And then uh, when it comes to, uh, um, you know, having the business located in the Bay Area as well as Richmond, how do you manage that? Is it mostly, uh, no. <laughs> if we could kind of touch on that for a minute here. Yeah, still trying to figure it out, man. Um, <laughs> that was an accident. We, you know, we, Sarah and I, we left, we left California the day the first San Francisco COVID case was announced. And I mean, we had already planned on leaving, but it was right when the COVID stuff was happening. And it's like, we had some family stuff happening that we had to come home for, but the, the pandemic or the very beginning when people were freaked out, that was our, that had a lot to do with our decision to leave. And I was like, the Bay area is done. You know, it's, it was fun while it lasted, but I need to go back to my people back to Virginia. And, you know, we were dro- we drove across the country for three days and got back. And there was like those first, that first crazy lockdown where people were like, you know, really locked down or whatever we called it. And, um, and then, then this whole frenzy of this outdoor living and construction and home remodeling thing started and, and it just exploded. So, you know, I think I have the pandemic to thank, but, um, you know, I, I do have a couple of guys that work for me that are local to the Bay area. So they live there full time. And then I, I, it's just me for now in, in, in Richmond, but I travel back and forth to the Bay area. I didn't do it much during the pandemic, but I was there a few weeks ago and I'm going to go back in a few weeks and then I'm going to go back in um, November. So it's, it's, um, you know, the remote thing is hard. And it's, I, you know, for anybody that's listening to this, that watches me on Instagram, I talk a lot of trash about remote design, but you know, we do kind of do it because I'm sitting in Richmond right now, actively working for people that are in the Bay area. Um, So it is remote in that sense, but a lot of our, a lot of our Bay Area clients with their their comfort around technology, you know, we were doing Zoom Zoom calls long before anybody knew what COVID was. You know, I mean, you can't get on the highway and drive 10 miles during rush hour and have it not take you two hours. So we were doing Zoom calls before that. So it was a really easy transition. Um, I think as far as managing it, it just really kind of comes down to having really solid contracting like contractor relationships because you know i can have my go-to guy in in the bay area building a yard or five like he is right now and we're in you know day-to-day contact um and then when i go to the bay area and i have things that are happening in richmond i have the same relationship with the guys here so you know it's it's we've been doing it i've been doing it a long, long time with the folks in Richmond. I've been doing it for four or five years with the folks in the Bay Area. But I mean, once once that sort of designer contractor relationship is forged and you have several under the belt, I mean, you're sort of able to answer questions on behalf of the other person, right? Like I know how they're going to build it and they know how I'm going to design it. So it's kind of, it kind of just works. I mean, it works till it doesn't. So you touched on it there, contractor relationships. How how have you built those? How have you found the contractors that you know, like, and trust, and they're now in your network? Everybody was a situation at one point where it was the first time that I had worked for them. And every time I brought a new contractor on into the pool of contractors was because I was having an issue with another contractor, or I just was in a bind and t- didn't didn't have anybody in my role decks that could build what we were designing. Right. And, you know, there's like the early design mistakes of, of designing things that aren't able to be built, but then you sort of, you know, ex- with experience comes wanting to design things that you haven't been designed before, but then you have to find the person that can build that. And there's things that I can talk about and talk to clients about how they work and how they're built, but sometimes I don't have that person to build it. So usually those sort of flagship projects where we're going a new direction with a new thing, I'll meet somebody new. Um, I mean, I've got my two favorite guys in the Bay area and, you know, it's, there's, you know, there's stress and shit happen. excuse me, um, bad stuff happens all the time. Um, but it's, you know, we get through it. And at the end of the day, you know, we can, we can get through stress and, 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 um, and uh-ohs and, and unhappy clients and frustrated clients, but it always resets at the end. And then we start again, fresh. Um, you know, in Richmond, growing up as a salesman and meeting all these people, that's how I forged the the East Coast relationships is pretty much everybody that I work with, work with in Richmond, I sold something for at some point. 
So I've known them even longer. And most of those companies are still rocking uh, just with a few more gray hairs. So um, yeah, that's, that's how. Gotcha. So let's, let's get into design here. And Matt, I totally forgot to ask you how long you're good till. Are you good till like uh, just before 4 PM? Is that okay? Yeah, that's cool. That works. Cool. Um, so design, uh, you're going to meet a client that, or let's, let's start with, you know, you found out they're a good fit. Uh, they hop on a phone call with you or uh, from that phone call, what are you asking them? Or are you mostly just establishing a consultation time so that you can actually go meet them at the house, see the, the property? Uh, where does that initial kind of phone call touch point go? Yeah. So, so, I mean, so I've, I've received the survey, I've got the 20 questions. I know what they want to build. I know what they will, you know, if they've worked with the designer, if they have site plans, I know loosely what their budget is. I mean, the, the 15 minute phone call that they schedule in my calendar, I mean, it's super loose. I don't, there's no script or it's kind of how you, what's up, you know, like, what do you, you know, they've, most people that I talk to on the phone, well, all people that I've talked to on the phone that filled out that survey have waited at least 10 days to talk to me on the phone. So it's been in their calendar. They've been staring at it. They're getting reminder emails from my, my system. So they're, they're primed for what they want to talk about. Right. Um, and I mean, that's, that's a pretty good client, even if they're not a client yet, somebody that's going to wait 10 days to talk. I mean, that's amazing. It makes me feel so good. Um, but it's really casual. I just kind of treat it like, 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 like somebody I'd meet in, in line for an ice cream cone, you know, it's like, what are you thinking about? And how many kids do you have? And uh, what do you do for a living? I used to not ask people that, but I ask them that all the time, because, you know, if they're a software engineer, or they're a a surgeon where the conversation is going to kind of go a different direction um, and just kind of get information, information from them. You know, if they, I get a lot of people who, who have the money to spend, but they like, well, I do this and this for a living. And, and like, so I know how this works, even though they have no idea what they're talking about. And so those people I try to scare, you know, I give them some nightmare stories about something that we're currently dealing with just to, to kind of see how they, how they process it. Um, but most times it's basically just to explain how we charge and kind of go through the process. And then if they want to, if they want to have us come over for a, for a consultation, which we do charge for, we don't do free estimates other than that 15 minute phone call. So, um, just to kind of get, I mean, just to build upon the survey that we already have. So we have a narrative of really what direction they want to go and also to figure out if they're a good fit or not. Right. Because if they're not. I'm not, I, I hate to say wasting time, but I'm not going to waste my time to go meet with somebody that I know is going to be a bad fit when I can just give them a number for somebody else that I know and trust in the area, that person's business is going to be supported. And I just, I just shaved three hours off my life or I rather added three hours to my life. So with that, you're, you go meet them now. What is that initial consultation? Like, are you taking it all in um, like, are you getting measurements? How do you go about that? Or just that, let, let's just start with that initial consultation. Like you, you've talked to them on the phone. What kind of questions are you going to ask them on the initial consultation to kind of get a better feel for what they want? Yeah. So I, I mean, the, you know, when I pull up to a house, the first thing I'm going to look at is the kind of cars that drive and that might sound horrible, but it, it's less about cost and more about kind, right? Like sports car versus pickup truck versus minivan. I mean, if there's a minivan in the driveway, they've got kids. So rather than saying, Hey, do you have kids? You can say, how many kids do you have? And it just sounds a lot more personable, right? Um, sport car, you know, living fast in the, or living life in the fast lane, people like fancy looking stuff and pickup trucks, contractors, you talk to them a lot differently than you would somebody that drives a minivan. So Cars is always the first thing. And then I always try to see their living room, which is hard these days because you don't really go inside anymore. I guess that's just kind of starting to pick back up. Um, but the, the consult, you know, they're paying us to be there. So it's, we kind of need to kind of have that first consultation be sort of a point of, of we are serving them. So what are some of your ideas? And then they spit them out and we say, okay, we think, what do you think about this? And just sort of lay it out in the yard. And then kind of sit there and try to get ideas. And well, I don't, they say, I don't like that because X. And then they give us an idea and we don't, we, I don't like that because X and just try to get uh, on a neutral playing field as far as, you know, desires versus expectations. Um, and then, you know, through, you know, we don't, I don't take measurements anymore. I'm done with measurements. Uh, 
have had, you know, haven't had too many, I probably under five times in the last 10 years where I've missed a measurement big time. Um, and like, not like a foot or six inches, like 10 or 15 feet. And I'm, for whatever reason, right. Um, had too much fun last night, just not paying attention. Something's wrong with one of the tools. So we, you know, 95% of our clients are getting, we are bringing a civil engineer in to record the, um, the dimensions of the space, the topography of the space, the structure, the, the dimensions of the structure, and then the property lines. Um, so other than that, just kind of, kind of going over again, how we charge. And, you know, usually if we're there and they're paying us to be there, they're already comfortable with, with what we charge. Um, but just, you know, it's kind of an interview for them and for us too, kind of that last point of no return, because they're going to get a, a proposal the next morning of, of what we're going to charge and, and when we're going to be available. So why, why uh, take a look at their living room? What are you trying to get out of that? Yeah. I mean, you, you learn a lot about somebody by the way that they live. And so when I'm looking at somebody's living room, I'm not looking at like how clean it is or, or, or that I'm, I'm looking at how the furniture is laid out and what kind of furniture and how big the TV is. And, you know, if, if somebody has got an aquarium in their living room and it's like three times the size of the TV, I sound like, I think that they are probably more into the aquarium than they are to the TV. Right. Uh, which that usually isn't the case because most TVs are the size of cars these days. But I, I, it's just to kind of see how, how they live their life. And you know, look, you can talk to a client all day long and say, like, let me see your Pinterest board. But Pinterest boards and in, in all that sort of in, initial inspiration, and, I mean, it works because it's what they like. But I want to see how you live. And if I'm in your backyard, there's probably a fair chance that you don't live outside much or you wouldn't need me. So inside is the place to get those to sort of gather that intel so if a if a you go into the living room of a client's place and they've got a massive tv and they've got <laughs> sports memorabilia all over yeah. the place what kind of what kind of thoughts are you going what what are, what's going through your head in terms of a design for their backyard i mean i i, I think it's probably less about design and more about an in, initial conversation so if you walked into sort of like a, a um a man cave kind of thing like what you're talking about like I would, it would probably kind of, it would guide me the, on the questions to ask. Like, I, like I'd say, so how, what do you think about having a TV outside? Because clearly you have a place that you love spending time. So would you like that place to remain, remain sort of your home base for your, for your sports watching? Or would you like to be able to do what you're doing inside right now, outside as well, minus the sports memorabilia, right? So, and then like just using what they currently have and, and how they, live their lives uh, and using that to, to um, further the narrative of, of, of what I think they're going to want to do uh, in the future in their new backyard. So from that initial consultation, you've probably got like a, a general idea of where you might take that, that direction of that backyard. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So then where, where does it start to play in where you decide where things go? And are you running this past the client or is this a matter of you've got a good idea of the, the, the features that they want in their backyard. And it's just uh -huh. a matter of, you know, where those are going to go in the space and presenting that to the client. I mean, yeah. So it's, we, I don't, I don't really lay out too much for them, anything for them. You know, we, sh it, it, that, it, that gets tackled in the first round of designs, which are just highly conceptual 2d hand drawings and that's where we're sort of proposing what we're going to do and then so every one of our new clients the first thing that they see is two designs an a and a b so for the a we're always going to play it safe right it's going to be like well here's the pool where you want it and here's the kitchen where you want it and then here's b and this is what we want to do and then, so I'm going <laughs> to, it depends on the client and the situation and the budget, but I'm usually going to use B as a means to talk them out of A or, or this is why this is better. And this is why I think that you would get more functional use of the space, but kind of giving them their idea. And then our idea serves as a really interesting uh, introduction to the design uh, point of entry because you can 
say you can just sort of kind of pick their pick the idea we did of theirs, pick our idea, or marry the two. And usually we're marrying the two. So then, uh, where does that differing opinion come from between A and B? Like they they have a vision in their mind and they set it out, and you design that for them. And A, but you've got a much different idea and. It's still incorporating those same features, but you present that in design B. Is that a matter of, you know, taking their budgets and kind of stretching it a little bit more to say, hey, you can get this, but you actually, if you, you know, top up your budget a little bit more, you can get this. Or is this a matter of you adding your own personal style onto design B and and showing them, you know, this is your vision, this is ours? I mean, yeah, the latter, showing them kind of what direction we want them to go and if they're offering ideas that I don't agree with or that I think is bad, you know, I don't just roll over and say, like, okay, fine. Like I push back hard and usually I have a rule of pushing back twice. And if they're still not letting me through, then just to leave it alone. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 I'm a big believer in collaborating with our clients. You know, they're not, they're not bringing us in to design their project. They're bringing us in to collaborate with them on their, on their project. So you know, if they, if they're hell bent on keeping something like we're going to figure out how to, how to make that happen. Uh, it's not really influenced by budget in the beginning. I mean, sure. There's a lot, big difference between somebody that has hundred K versus 600 K, but you know, we're, we're not going like pound for pound, dollar for dollar, inch by inch. Like this is going to add 80 K, right? Like we're designing what we think that they want and what I want in my portfolio and then figuring out what the happy medium is. And then once we get through that design process much later, then we're going to value engineer and kind of usually we'll get a round of pricing from somebody first, um, whatever contractor I want to build the project. And then we'll sort of use that as, as a, as a, um, you know, as a price point and then, and then break those numbers up and, then I'm able to actually inch for inch figure out what they'll save. What's more fun or challenging to you, or maybe this goes hand in hand, a small space or a big space? Oh man, I don't know. I think, I think that's hard. So there's big space, small space. I mean, I'm going to have to say small to medium space because that plays very interestingly into the two places that we serve, you know, in the Bay area, the majority of our clients live in a 13 to 1500 square foot home and their backyard is not big. And the backyard is about the size you would imagine it to be. Whereas in, in Virginia, you know, it's not rare for our clients to live on at least an acre, right. Or usually have way more than that. So I, I would say the small ones are my favorite. You know, my sort of target areas on the Virginia side are in the city where I live, where it's small, compact, you know, not brownstones, but like call them row houses um, and just the older hundred, you know, hundred year old construction, these posted stamp backyards because a budget goes a lot further. Um, and then in the Bay area, you know, the small to medium ones. Yeah. I, I think I need to, as a business that supports our, clients, but you know, also supports the contractors that, that build the work for those clients. And for us, I need to keep in mind the people that, that we award these bids to and what they like doing. And I think every contractor would agree that they like smaller projects more. Well, not everyone, sorry guys, if I just threw you into a bucket, but um, most because their margins are realized quicker and the projects go a lot faster versus we've got one right now in the Bay area. That's going to be a million plus. And yeah, it was fun to design. Yeah. It's going to look rad, but that contractor is going to hate the next year of their life. Right. So if, you know, if that was, if that was ten hundred thousand dollar projects, I'd imagine that they'd have a lot more fun with those 10 projects than one, you know, sticking in one place for a year. How do you create flow in a space where, um, say, you've got a small to medium sized space and this client wants everything from a swimming pool to uh, an outdoor bar, kitchen, uh, you know, pergola, fire feature? Is it is it like completely 
on a design des by design basis, or is this something that you have a pretty good system down in terms of uh, kitchen space is going to go closer to the house, which will be followed by an entertainment space because that plays well off of a kitchen space, which then flows into a pool space. Like what, what's your ideas or what's your concepts around flow in a space? I mean, I think about it as experiences and, you know, sort of having outdoor experiences. So I like to, I'm a big believer in focal points and sort of what way that you look right. Because, you know, anybody can walk into a new backyard and be like, oh, this is so nice. You know, you got all the things, but like where, what's the first thing that person sees before they say that, right? Like I, what direction are their eyes going? And then if they walk out into the backyard and they sit in a chair or sit at a bar stool, once they their butt hits that seat, what's the first thing that they see? And so I like to think a lot about experiences and what people are experiencing as they move throughout a space. And I think if it's done successfully, you can give a user a lot or many different experiences many different times in the same space. Um, I, you know, with small, with, with small spaces, I always joke with clients, well, let's make it smaller. So, you know, let's, Let's take your small backyard and instead of having one area where everything is happening, let's let's make let's do two smaller areas where everything is happening. So if you have area one and area two and then a means to get from the from you know from one to the next, it it almost sort of makes the space feel larger, right? So the more places there are to travel to, it, it, it the easier a space is to walk, even though it's small. I feel like it, it makes it makes it larger. And we just finished one that I really like in San Jose, small backyard, and we gave them four out. Well, yeah, four outdoor seating spaces. And so we jammed up this already small space. But I think it and the clients do as well. Thinks it think it feels way larger because not only are there different areas to look at and enjoy, um, but if you have a bunch of folks over, you can kind of have four different smaller groups of people. And it just, it almost in a strange way makes the space feel, feel larger. Um, I think it's a lot easier to make a small space feel larger than it is to make a large space feel smaller because, you know, on the Virginia side of things, and we, I don't do a lot of remote, just like remote, remote design to places I've never been, but we're doing one and I'm doing one right now in, in Annapolis in Maryland. And this yard is huge and they only want to develop like the first third of it. And like, I'm trying to figure out ways to sort of screen the rest of the yard so they can kind of see it, but it just doesn't, doesn't feel like they built an outdoor living space on the first third of a football field, right? Like, but that's, that's what we deal with a lot in Virginia is projects like that. And when it comes to choosing the right product for a client, how do you get down to choosing the right color blend, shape, size, texture? Like, is this all a part of that initial visit when you see the house? Is this a part of getting their tastes and understanding and just asking them questions? How does that kind of play into everything? So on my 20 question survey, before I ever talk to somebody, one of the, one of the 20 questions is what are two of them are, what, what, what are your favorite three colors together? And then what are your least favorite three colors together? And I, I kind of use that as a personality question, but I also use it for design. Um, but I think with, you know, I, it's interesting. Clients aren't as concerned about material colors. I mean, some are for sure, but most in my experience aren't because they just want it to look like a water and earth backyard. Right. So there's going to be a deck and we love decks. Um, and then that's going to, that's going to, going to sort of bleed into a paving space and I know, some kind of outdoor living space, whether it's pergola, pool, fireplace, kitchen, or all of the above. Um, you know, I mean, we went really hard in the paint for Tackle Block, and um, I love Tackle Block. I love Tackle Block, and I, you know, I they weren't available in the Bay Area when I first got there, and we we got Tackle Block there, and it's insanely popular, and I love it. But I've like in trying to get my fan base to love Tackle Block, all of a sudden, all we're doing is Tackle Block projects, and you know, with all due respect to you Tackle Block guys, you know, you know how I feel about you. Um, we need to start getting back to some like natural stone and some other things, because I mean, when, when, when anybody looks back at my portfolio three or four years from now, it's just going to be this gap, <laughs> multiple year gap of tech block. And so I, I've like, one thing I've 
really started to do is, is bringing in and sort of learning about materials that I, that I don't, wouldn't otherwise use. So kind of the bamboo decking and like just the stuff that kind of more of that kind of Southern California and Los Angeles vibe kind of stuff, kind of trying to get that up to the Bay area. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of a natural conversation, but a lot of times people that come in as clients have like, you know, their Pinterest board has like 10 of our photos on it. So I already know what they are, what they want and, and to what intensity they want to bring it to. Do, uh, do you have, I, I, we're coming right down to the end here, Matt. So I, I do really appreciate your time here, but do you have clients that say like they want it to match their brick or to match the siding of their home as much as possible? And you're trying to play with that. Like, how does, the, how do you play with that in your mind? Uh, I don't match anything. Whenever someone says, and most people say they want to match something, I, the, the goal is not to match. The goal is to contrast because if you try to match and you don't get it perfectly, it's going to look like someone did something that didn't know what they were doing. So I'm always a big fan of contrasting. And um, with the contrast, you can be, you can make bolder decisions with new materials, whereas people think that they want to match. So they are going to be less open to bringing something new and interesting onto their property. But when you get them comfortable with contrasting, then that opens the floodgates for uh, new ideas and new ideas are uh, what we're about. I love that. That's a great way to end this. Matt, thank you so much for your time. I do have one final question. It kind of puts you on the spot. So uh, it is something that I ask every business owner that comes on the show. And I'll ask it and then I'll talk a little bit to so that you have some time to think about the answer that you want to give here. But yeah. what is one thing you know now that you wish you knew from the very beginning when you, before you started this business or um, just personally business related, it can be anything, but what's one thing you know now that you wish you knew from the very beginning? I wish I knew that there was a place unlike where I started that where, where homeowners only hire designers before they moved forward with their projects because I would have moved there long before I did. Amazing. Matt, thank you so much for your time. Where can our audience go to find out more about you, what you got going on over there at Water and Earth? Yeah, so we're on Instagram at, um, at we underscore landscape design uh, and then on the web at uh, waterandearthld.com. Uh, on the San Jose side of that and on the Richmond, Virginia side, um, well, I have a content writer and we write blogs together. So, you know, my uh, my version of the podcast or the YouTube channel is blogging and uh, we're getting really good at it. So we got a lot of stuff in there about you know, how we're thinking about projects before we start them and, you know, uh, how that evolution happens from the first conversation with the client to the, the end of the design. And then we have a whole other section with... Um, with completed construction projects and how that, how well, or how, how horribly that went. Matt, thank you so much for your time here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for listening to today's podcast episode. Once again, go check out Matt's work at W E underscore landscape design on Instagram. Give him a thanks for coming on the show or just reach out to him there on Instagram as well as our sponsors of today's episode in light design, I N L I T E design on Instagram. Check out their outdoor lighting products and get inspiration from their page as well. And cycle CPA. If you need bookkeeping accountants or CFO services for your business, go check them out and let them know how to hardscape sent you for $200 off their services. And we look forward to, meeting with you next week on the How to Hardscape podcast.